So hello, everybody. Welcome to Bird Identification for Beginners. Um, just a couple of sort of housekeeping notes. Um, this webinar is being recorded, just so that you know. Um, it is, as I said earlier, in case any of you missed it, only a webinar style, so you'll only be able to see the video of myself and Robert up in the corner, and that's, that's how it's supposed to be, so don't worry about that. You can feel free to pop questions into the chat box as we go along. Um, there is quite a lot of content to go through, so hopefully I'll have some time at the end to get to those, and uh, we'll see how things go, but definitely put some questions in there if you have them. And great. That's all of that. So let's just begin. Um, there we go. So I'll just give you a bit of an introduction to, to myself. My name is Jenna McDermott. Um, I currently live in Cornerbrook in Newfoundland. I am from Ontario. Um, and about I've been in Cornerbrook and Newfoundland for six years or so. I love it here. Um, and I really enjoy watching the birds here. Um, birding and bird watching has been an interest of mine since around when I graduated undergrad back in Ontario. And since then, I sort of took every opportunity that I could to take contracts and do volunteering um, just on my own time, learn as much about birds as I could. And I'm still learning to this day. So it's sort of a never ending, a never ending activity. The company that I work for is an organization called Birds Canada, and we're a nonprofit organization who is nationwide, so we're across Canada, and our mission is to conserve wild birds through sound science, on the ground actions, innovative partnerships, public engagement, and science-based advocacy. And so a lot of our programs, we do have quite a few, are really heavily based on citizen scientists and the data that comes from them. And that, that just means um, citizen scientists are people just like you who are volunteering their time um, and they really love birds. And so they're collecting data based on the birds that they see and the programs they're involved in. And it goes into this, these long-term data sets that we have at Birds Canada. So currently my role in Newfoundland is the assistant coordinator of the Newfoundland Breeding Bird Atlas. The Breeding Bird Atlas is a five-year program. We only began it last year. And the intention of this program is to map the distribution and the abundance of all of the birds that breed in Newfoundland on the island. So it's really quite a, a big project to undertake. And it, again, heavily relies on volunteers and citizen scientists to share their data with us about what birds they're seeing, where they are, and what they're doing. Um, so if this is something you might be interested in uh, while you're learning your birds, feel free to give, um, drop us an email. I'll have contact information at the end. Another project that we run is the Atlantic Nocturnal Owl Survey. We run the sections in Newfoundland and in Labrador. Um, and this is another really great program is just finishing up for the year where volunteers can sign up for a route that they drive uh, at the beginning of the spring every year. And they go to a, a, a series of stops where they can listen for owls. Um, and then they report back to us the data on the species of owls and uh, how many they're hearing, things like that. So it's really interesting. Again, if you're interested in this program, feel free to get in contact uh, by email. I'll, I'll show that information at the end. And just before we get into the main event today, um, I would just quickly like to thank our partners and funders you can see here, uh, without their support and funding, we wouldn't be able to put on webinars like this. So thank you very much to all of them. As well as I'd like to shout out to Leanne Lachimoy, who is another of my coworkers with Birds Canada, um, for letting me sort of take the shell of this presentation and change a little bit to, to be a focus on Newfoundland and Labrador. Perfect. So let's get started. Um, what we're gonna go through today is not we're not gonna get into really details of identifying specific bird species um, because that would be a lot to get through through an hour webinar. Um, same thing, we're not gonna get into identifying things by song or call. Again, far too much to get through in an hour. We are gonna be going through sort of broad strokes, basic identification markers and clues you can look for that's gonna help you start knowing how to identify birds. 
We're also going to go through um, the basic tools of what you can use that's going to help you while you're identifying birds, as well as getting into the major bird families you'll find in Newfoundland um, and sort of broad clues of how to how to get a bird down into what family it is. So one of the important things that you're going to need if you're identifying birds is a set of binoculars. You can, of course, watch birds with your eyes alone, um, it, but it can be a little bit frustrating sometimes if you're trying to identify a bird because it's often going to be too far away and you won't be able to get those key identification clues that you will need um, to make to make a proper identification. So binoculars are going to be able to really bring this bird up close to you by magnifying it. Um, when you're looking at different binoculars, they're going to have two different numbers associated with them. So for example, this pair here is 8 by 42. The number 8 tells you the magnification of the lens that's up near your eye. So 8 times magnification is a pretty good number to look for. And the 42 is the number that shows you the aperture, which is just telling you how much brightness is coming into the binocular and how bright of an image you're going to get. So you can get binoculars that have higher numbers than this, that have higher magnification. And you might think bigger is better in this case, um, but that's not necessarily true because the bigger your binocular is, the harder you're gonna have keeping it steady while you're looking at a bird um, up in a tree or wherever you're looking at it. So the number eight by 42 is a pretty good, um, a pretty good number to shoot for. It's gonna be strong enough to get, uh, get the bird up closer, um, but also light enough that you'll actually be able to manage it. When you're using your binoculars, up at the top by your eyes, they're gonna have eye caps. And you can either have them in an upright position, which is gonna be useful if you don't have glasses. You'll keep, wanna keep those raised up. They either twist or flip up. Um, or if you wear sunglasses or prescription glasses, you're gonna to want to have them down as far as they can go. And this just helps keep the proper distancing to your eye um, and helps, helps um, focus the bird properly for you. So when you're starting to use binoculars, the way that you're gonna try and go about it is look at the thing you're looking at, like the bird, and then raise the binoculars up to your face. You're not gonna try and move your whole head around looking for the bird because you're probably not gonna be able to find it like that. So this is really important. Find the bird with your eyes and your ears and then raise your binoculars up. That's really gonna help you um, to not become frustrated while you're trying to use binoculars. Another good point is to practice at home. It may seem silly, but just go about your house, um, find something on the wall, a picture, uh, anything that you want, and just practice looking at it with your eyes and then raising your binoculars up. And just keep practicing with things, different distances away, um, different sizes of objects until you're comfortable that you can get the object in your binoculars nearly every time. That's gonna really help you when you're out looking at a bird in a tree and you won't be able, or you won't have to get frustrated by not being able to find it. Another note about binoculars is there are multiple different kinds and brands to sort of mid-range price uh, Price-wise and quality-wise are Nikon and Vortex, and I'll send that in an email afterwards as well, so you don't need to worry about writing it down. Um, those are really good brands to look at, and I would recommend just trying different ones if you can before you buy them, because they can be somewhat different in sizes. For example, um, my eyes are really narrow, close together, so it's hard to find a pair of binoculars that um, can focus the two eyes together. So just um, note which binoculars work best for you, borrow them from friends if you can, um, try and find a pair that fits for you. Another thing that's gonna be really important while you're trying to identify birds is a field guide. Um, and this is a book. Uh, you can get ones that are physical book copies, which are really handy because you can bring them out in your backpack with you. You don't have to worry about them getting broken. You can drop them, nothing bad is gonna happen. Um, so paper field guides are really helpful. They come in a, different, diff a few different versions. They're painted field guides. And the pictures in these ones are gonna be paintings of birds um, that are shown in a fashion that show you the key identifying features.
features uh, with arrows usually pointing to them, that sort of thing. They really point out the key identification features to you. This is um, different compared to a photographic field guide, which there are plenty of really nice ones. Um, and those ones, the pictures of birds are, as you would expect, a photograph. And so these ones don't necessarily point out all of the key identification features um, in quite as simple of a manner, but they are obviously more lifelike pictures of them. You can also get regional field guides. For example, um, the Sibley's Bird Guide, which is a really popular one. Um, it will be for all of North America. So that book can get pretty hefty. If you want to cut down on the size of book you're carrying around with you, you could get, for example, Sibley's Birds to the East. And so that's only gonna be about half the size. And that's the one I actually have here with me. And it's really handy for um, being light enough to carry around with you while you're going out in the world. There are other, other different guides that you can get, like Peterson's is another well-known one. Um, and then in Newfoundland, there's one called Birds of Newfoundland. That's not gonna have every single species that you might find in Newfoundland, but it's gonna have the common ones that you'll find. So that'd be a, that'd be a pretty good book um, to start off with. You can also get reference guides. And so they're not ones that you're gonna bring outside with you while you're hiking or walking, um, because they're gonna be big, big hefty books, um, better for leaving at home, looking things up in after you have a question, uh, after you're coming back inside from your day out, that sort of thing. But they often have a lot of really great information in them. As I said, there's a lot of different types of field guides. And so I would recommend using your public library to your advantage. The public library is gonna have likely a few different bird field guides. And so you can borrow them, try them out, see which ones you like best, um, that kind of thing. I will say also in Newfoundland, there's a really cool program going on um, where you can borrow, if you're in the St. John's area, there's a few libraries there. They've partnered with Nature Newfoundland and Labrador, where you can borrow an entire backpack for bird watching. So it's gonna have a field guide in it, a pair of binoculars, a couple of other items, I believe. And they also have ones for children. So they have children's binoculars and like a bingo game, that kind of thing. Um, so if you're in and around St. John's, uh, check out your library for that. And I think they're trying to get that spread across the island a little bit more as well in the future. So the Sibley's Bird uh, Guide to Birds is one of the really popular field guides. And this is just an example of how it will be laid out. So you'll see there's always going to be um, these images of the birds. They'll have images of a male, a female, a young bird, and an adult, um, and sometimes other variations as well. And then they'll have sort of a description of the bird, the size of the bird, that kind of thing, a description of its voice, a range map that shows where you'll be able to find it, and sometimes some other key information about habitat, that kind of stuff. So here's the National Geographic Field Guide to North America. You'll see it's uh, got nearly the same information in it. It's just laid out a little bit differently. So your field guides are gonna differ from each other, but they're all gonna have these uh, this basic set of information with, with pictures of what to look at, um, descriptions, and a, and a range map for every bird. Now field guides are organized by families of birds. So these are based on taxonomy, which just to, uh, is how genetically similar different species are to each other. So a family, the, the page that shows the family at the beginning is going to have this um, broad paragraph that shows how these birds are similar to each other within the family. And I'll note that different bird books will have the families sometimes in different orders. That's just because new information comes in about how related different birds are to each other, um, research is done, and um, scientists reorder the taxonomy. And so sometimes the ordering of your family will differ in a little bit, differ a little bit between guys, and that's fine. Um, it might differ depending on when the book was printed or just what version they're using. So do note that that can happen. Don't be concerned if you can't find a certain family in the same place you expected it. Um, it will be in there somewhere, just maybe in a different order. 
Um, so just when you pick a guide that you like best, you'll get to know the order in your own guide and you won't need to worry. As I mentioned, in a field guide, it's always going to have a range map for each species. And this is going to show you roughly where and when a bird is likely to be soon seen. And it's a really important piece of information for you. It really helps narrow down your search um, when you're looking at a different species. So let's say you see a yellow bird. There could be a lot of different birds that look kind of similar, but you may find that only one of them is actually found in your area. This map is going to be split up into multiple seasons. They usually are found in breeding season, migration, non-breeding season, and year round. So based on the time of year and where you are, where you are, you'll be able to find out if the species that you think something might is, is actually expected. These maps can also change um, over the years, much like the taxonomy, just because new information does come in or species ranges do change over time. And so take the map a little bit with a grain of salt, especially if you're near the edge of where it says a species could be found. Um, but it is really definitely gonna be a good indicator for you. Apart from um, paper field guides, you can also get smartphone or tablet apps. Um, and they often contain much of the same information. Um, some examples are iBird Pro, the Sibley Birds of North America. And some of these are paid as well as if you were to buy a book. Others are free like the Audubon Bird Guide. And then there are other versions um, that can be used as an identification tool. So you can put in information and it will give you some possible species uh, that, that the bird you saw could be. So the nice thing about smartphone apps is that they often include um, a series of songs or calls that you could hear from the bird. So that's also um, an interesting section to learn like later on if you have the opportunity. So the Merlin app, which I noted at the bottom there, can be used as a general field guide through the Explore Birds function. This is a free app through the Cornell Lab of Ornithology. And so it's just going to show you all of the birds that are possible um, in your area. And you'll be able to click on each bird and you'll get a, a description, um, some pictures and some sounds and a map for that bird as well, just like you would in a paper field guide. Okay, so we're gonna get a little bit into um, how to identify birds now. So some tips when you're getting started are, the most important one is that mistakes are going to happen. Um, everybody was a beginner at some point and it's gonna take some time to learn things. And it's also sometimes just difficult to be able to see the features that are really gonna help you identify a bird. So sometimes you're gonna identify it to the wrong species or you're not gonna be able to identify it down to species. You'll only be able to say that's a duck and that's all you'll be able to, that's all you'll be able to know. And that's fine. I'll urge you to start identifying birds with the common birds that you see um, around your yard or around town, like a robin. Most people already probably know what a robin is. So you might be able to look at blue jays, get to know these common birds and really take a look at them um, to see what features you can see on them. and try and note like what features are what make that bird the bird that you know they are. <laughs> um, when you're looking at a bird in a tree or wherever, try and keep your eyes on the bird. Um, it's really tempting and I do the same thing. I have to stop myself all the time. As you look at the bird, you see, oh, there's a really cool bird there. And you're not sure what it is. And then you go straight into looking at your field guide um, to try and find out what species it might be. I'll urge you to just watch that bird for a while. Watch it for a couple of minutes, see what features you can see on it, see what it's doing. Um, all of these things are gonna be really important clues for you. So collect as many identification clues as you can about what it looks like, what colors it is, what shape it is, all that sort of thing. We'll go into these more details um, in a minute. As I mentioned, you might only be able to identify a bird up to a family or a group. So you might only be able to tell that it is a gull or that it's a duck and that's perfectly fine. That's uh, absolutely great. <laughs> and I will urge you also to learn your field guide. So whichever one you decide you uh, would like to buy or that you're borrowing from the library most often, um, just 
keep it on your table, flip through it. You'll glean a lot of information just from uh, looking at the pictures in it. And uh, even if you're not studying it, um, just take a look at your field guide anytime you can. Perfect. So we'll move on now to the four key things that are important to identifying birds and really anything in life. So I'll give you an example. I have here an orange, like a food orange. And so we're gonna look at the shape, size, context and coloration of this orange. So a lot of different things can be round. A lot of different things can be around this size. A lot of different things can be a piece of food and a lot of different things can be orange colored. However, the combination of these four things really can help you know that this is an orange nearly every time. And so we're gonna use the same, the same clues when we're looking at birds. We're gonna start with shape because sometimes you're only gonna see the silhouette of a bird or it's gonna to be too far away, you'll only be able to see the shape of it. So you're gonna look at the neck, the tail, the beak and the wings and just take a look at the shape of all of it. So for example, in this picture, you can see that these three birds, they all have pretty long beaks. However, if we start looking at the shape of other parts of the bird, you'll see that the bird on the right has a really, really long neck. The bird in the middle is sort of a medium sized neck. And the bird on the left has a tiny little neck or maybe none at all. It's like his head is just plopped right onto his shoulders. So because you've looked at the shape of the neck in this case, you can tell that these are three different species. The Peterson Field Guide um, has this really nice page um, where it shows you the silhouettes of many common birds um, along the roadside, they say. And so this just brings into a highlight the different shapes of things. So if you look at number 27 down at the bottom, which is a pheasant, which we don't really have here, but you can see that has a super long tail held upright. Um, compared to, let's look at number 21, um, which is a robin sitting on the wire, and it has sort of a shorter tail and it's pretty square. So it, this just highlights um, the different shapes of beaks and tails and how a bird hold itself, its posture. So these are really important things to look at. Another in time when shape can be important is when you're looking at birds in flight, especially um, your birds of prey. So falcons, excipiters, and budios, which are your hawks. Um, and they are gonna have different shapes of wings and tails. And we're not gonna get really into this because it can be quite complex, but just note that um, looking at the shape of birds while they're flying can also be really helpful. We're gonna get a little bit closer look at the shape of birds' bills. And because birds don't have hands or arms, um, they do do all of their food manipulation using their bill. And that makes each one um, quite distinct and shows you sort of how they use it um, for their lifestyle. So for example, we could have a long and straight bill. And these are found on a lot of different shorebirds and that's because they're sort of probing into the ground or into the sand, looking for small insects um, or things like that to grab out of of the ground. As opposed to the middle top, we have a wedge-shaped bill. Um, you can also have hooked bills, like you'll find on the birds of prey, and this they really use for like ripping apart their food. You can have short and conical bills on the sparrows a lot, um, because they're using them to crush seeds, so they need to be really strong and sturdy. You can have short and pointed bills, and they're like a little pair of tweezers. Um, they're grabbing teeny little insects off of trees and leaves. Or you can have this very distinct duck bill, which is broad and flattened. And they're using that for straining out insects or, or plants from the water. So pay attention to the shape of a bill. The shape of a bird, I will note, can change um, depending on the weather or on how the bird is feeling. So take a look at, um, just pay attention to how their feathers are positioned and how they're standing as well. Because uh, depending on the weather, for example, this downy woodpecker on the left, it might look really slim and slender, but if it's cold out, it's gonna puff itself up and look quite a bit chubbier. And so try not to let that fool you. Same thing could happen with a robin here. It's like quite upright and 
uh, slender looking, but here it's cold and it's really like this really poofy tennis ball. So just do be aware that um, the, size, the shape of birds can change. And then you'll have here on the blue jay, for example, its crest is, the crest on top of its head is really upright and alert. Um, but if this bird is relaxed, maybe its crest is gonna be held down. The feather is gonna be held down against the head. Um, so the shape can change a little bit in that way. So these are just things to be aware of. We'll move on now to looking at the size of birds. Now size should always be used as more of a rough marker. Um, field guides will have the measurements of a bird's length in them, but knowing that something is two centimeters or even two inches larger or smaller than another is probably not gonna be really helpful when you're looking at them out in the real world. Um, so you can also compare the size of a bird's features within itself um, to help you understand what it is. So for example, this downy woodpecker on the top is said to have a small bill and the hairy woodpecker is said to have a large bill. And these are sort of the key identification features between the two birds, because as you can see, they look really, really similar. But then you think, what is a small bill and what is a large bill? If I see a bird just by itself, how am I supposed to tell what that is? And so this is when it's useful, especially with these two species, to compare the bill to the size of its own head. So for example, the downy woodpecker has a small bill, which means that it's less than half the length of its head if you turn the bill back on itself. So that's gonna reach just about the back of the eye. As opposed to the hairy woodpecker, the bill is large bill and it's greater than half the length of the head. So it's, as you can see down at the very bottom there, if you turn the bill back on its own head, it's gone way past the eye and it's farther past than half the size of the head. So this is called relative proportions. And these are, this is a, another really good thing to look at when you're looking at the size of things, how it is in relation to itself. You should also compare birds or the size of birds to other birds that you are more familiar with. So you can probably picture in your mind how large a sparrow is, how large a robin could be, or a crow or a goose, that sort of thing. So rather than saying that a bird is 17 centimeters tall, you might say, I know that this bird is larger than a crow, but smaller than a goose. And that's gonna be really helpful for you. In the same way, you can compare birds to objects whose size that you know. So if you have feeders in the winter, you can compare a bird to the size of the feeder or other objects in your yard. So size we're always using as a bit of a rough marker. We'll move now on to the context of a bird, or this just means where you're seeing it, the time of year, what it's doing, the habitat that you're in. So is the bird on a tree? Is it on the ground? Is it floating in the water or going under the water? All of these things can be clues to you about what the family is or what the species is. So you will get to know um, as you become more familiar with certain species or with other birds, um, what habitats they're expected to be in. So for example, the pictures that you see here, the one on the top and the bottom, you would be equally expecting an American robin in probably both of these spots. American robins are really generalist. They, they can be found basically anywhere. However, if we're talking about a white-throated sparrow, um, they're far more likely to be found in the top habitat compared to the bottom. And so as you get more familiar with birds, you'll be able to know, depending on where you are, what you could expect to find there. You can also look at the flight pattern um, as, a, as a context clue. And we won't get really too into this either, but um, just know that birds can fly in different ways. So sometimes they'll flap, flap, glide. And these are a lot of um, exhibitors, which are, which are a bird of prey or they can soar on thermals like gulls or large hawks, um, or they can have an undulating flight going up and down, that's woodpeckers and finches. Um, so just do note how it's flying and your field guide might give you a clue to that as well. And then also take a look at how a bird is feeding. So this is really helpful, especially with ducks because we do have two different kinds of ducks. There are dabbling ducks and there are diving ducks. Dabbling ducks are the ones that you're gonna see floating on top of the water, um, feeding on top of the water or tipping their butts up in the air. 
And so they're just getting uh, the food just underneath of the water. However, we also have diving ducks and these ones will submerge themselves completely and dive under the water to catch food. So they're going down to the bottom, they're getting small insects and plants down there. And so even if you have ducks that are super far away, um, you can barely see them at all, but you can tell that some are feeding on top of the water and some are diving underneath of the water, you can already distinguish um, which family you're looking at. And so we're finally gonna move on to the coloration. And I did leave this one for last because um, these other three, shape, size, and context are incredibly important because if you leave um, your only clues as the clues of color, you are likely to be misled. For example, here we have two birds and they're different colors. And so you might think because of that, if you're only looking at color, that these are two different species. However, this is the male who is in red or pink and the female who is a greenish sort of yellow of a pine grosbeak. So you do need to um, look at color, but definitely look at these other clues as well that we talked about just now. So you're gonna look at the colors and patterns overall on the bird, but you also can um, narrow in on some more key features. So look at the colors and patterns in the face. On the face, you're gonna have some key things like lines through the eye. They can go all the way to the back of the head. They can go right up to the beak. They can be only part of that. They can be um, present strongly or not strongly. You can also have an, a plain face with no features on it at all. Um, like you can see on the bottom on this yellow warbler. And that in itself is a feature as well. So just because you don't see anything there doesn't mean that you can't keep that as a note. That's gonna be really important to know as well. You can also have these big bold colors um, or you can have a ring around the eye um, that can be either wide and bold or small or incomplete, which means that it doesn't go all the way around the eye. So looking at the patterns on the face is gonna be important. You can also take a look at the colors and patterns on the breast and belly. This is especially helpful when you're looking at different sparrows. So you can look um, at whether the breast and belly is plain, if it's streaked, if it has a spot on it, um, if they have breast bands or a bib. So just do keep your eyes on this area of the bird as well. There's a lot of good clues to be found there. And the final area that's gonna be really important are the wings. So again, you can have different colors and patterns on the wings, like on the top left, this bay breasted warbler, you have these wing bars, these white bars on the wing. Um, some birds will have bars, some birds will not have bars. Um, so take a look at that. You can also like the crow on the bottom, find birds that have no markings on the wings. Again, like the face, this is really important to note as well. Just because there's nothing there doesn't mean it's not important. And this is really gonna be a useful identification clue. Um, on ducks again, they're often gonna have these really bold, bright colors um, on their inner wing. And these, this is called the speculum. And so take a look with your ducks, especially your dabbling ducks when they're flying away, uh, you'll be able to see these bold, bright colors there. And that's gonna be quite diagnostic for a lot of species. Um, when you're looking at the colors of birds, I will note that there are differences sometimes between male and female birds. This is called sexual dimorphism. So for example, um, you have these mallards on the left and the males on the top and the females on the bottom, and they look totally different in the color. Same thing with the house sparrow, which is on the right here. The male is on the top and the female is on the bottom. And the female is just this dull brown, but the male is quite boldly colored. So just be aware that males and females can look different but not for, not for every species, so do be aware. And in the same way, birds can also, uh, different species can have different colors during the season. So this American goldfinch on the left is very bright and bold yellow in the summer, but in the winter time, they will have a different set of feathers and it's quite a bit duller. Same thing with the ducks again, they'll go through this eclipse plumage, which is just when the males will look pretty much like a female duck. Uh, for a certain section of the summer. So do be aware of how different birds can look um, throughout the year. 
So there you go. That is the four key ID features that you're going to look at um, that's going to help you make an identification of a bird. And use as many clues of these as you possibly can, and that's really going to help you. And I'll just give you a quick example of the Merlin app again, where you can use it as a ID tool instead of just as a field guide. So if you go to start bird ID, let's say we saw this little bird here, this yellow bird, um, you'll be able to put in where you were, when you saw the bird. So these are all context clues. It's gonna ask you the size of the bird in relation to these um, main groupings that people are typically familiar with. It's gonna ask you the main colors. You can pick up to three, but you don't have to pick three. You just pick the main colors you see. So in this case, it is this bird is mainly black and yellow. So you just pick black and yellow in this case. And then it wants to know where the bird was. Um, so we say this time it's in a tree or a bush. This is another context clue. Then it creates a list of possible birds. So for example, this time it got it right and the first bird is an American goldfinch, just like what uh, we hypothetically saw. So it is gonna also give you this list of similar looking birds. Um, and this is really helpful, especially when you're learning because you can take a look at all those other birds. And because they look similar, you'll be able to try and pick out the differences. So um, if you're trying the Merlin app, just take a look at all the different birds that it's coming up with and see if they're found where you are, which they should be, how they look different, uh, what the differences might be. And it'll just help you learn the different clues you can look for. Okay. So we're going to get into looking at the different families of birds you can find in Newfoundland. Um, again, I'm just going to say we're not going to get really into species, um, identifying species, but we are going to focus, uh, there's going to be pictures, there are going to be birds that you can find in Newfoundland in the summer. Um, and then we're going to go through some main characteristics that, that you can use to identify a bird to a family. So let's get into the ducks. We've talked a little bit about the ducks already. Um, these are the dabbling ducks. So we are going to focus on the male ducks because they are much, uh, much easier to identify. If you want to get into female ducks, it's probably going to be a quite a bit harder. So I'd recommend when you're learning your ducks to start with the males. Their plumages are much simpler to look at. Um, dabbling ducks are comfortable on both land and in water. So their legs are pretty well centered along their body. Um, and they can walk on land and they can take off from land as well. Uh, when they're feeding, they're going to be feeding up at the top of the water or with their butts tucked up in the air. So you've probably seen that before. All right, so then we also have the diving ducks. The diving ducks have their legs set a little bit farther back on their body, which makes it a little bit harder for them to get around on land. They're a little bit more awkward, which means that their nests are often going to be pretty close to the edge of the water. You are going to see these ducks diving under the water, as I said, when they're feeding, and that's a really good clue. Um, their wings are also quite small for the size of their body, so they're going to need a little bit of time to take off from the water, a little bit of a runway. And again, uh, I would recommend trying to learn the males of these birds instead of the females first. If you are interested in identifying female ducks, you should learn the shape of them from the males. So the shape of the duck, even though the color is different, is gonna be the same. You can look at the patterns on the head and you can look at the color on the wing patch, which is that scapular coloration. And those are also gonna be the same as for the males. You will also find often males and females paired together, um, which can be helpful when you're starting to learn female ducks. But I recommend um, if you're just starting to learn identification, uh, don't worry too much about those female ducks. You'll have plenty of time to learn more about them as you go. Let's move on to grouse and their allies. And these are sort of your chicken-like birds. Um, they're walking around on the ground. They're pecking at the ground. They really are reminiscent of chicken. Um, we do have spruce grouse and rough grouse in Newfoundland, which have been introduced here. Um, but willow ptarmigan and rock ptarmigan are native to the island. Um, so these four, these four are quite quite awkward in the air, um, but very good on the ground. 
let's talk about loons. In Newfoundland, your most common loon is, is called the common loon, which is quite convenient. Um, these ones you're going to see on ponds and lakes throughout the island. Um, up there are some other loon species, but they're going to be more rare and uh, farther out in oceans or bays, that kind of thing. So the common loon is probably what you should focus in on. And loons are superficially duck-like. However, their legs are even farther back on the back of their body. And so they are incredibly awkward on land. You will never really see a loon walking around on land. They are very proficient divers. Um, and they do have this very sharp pointed bill, which is different from those other ducks that we were looking at before, or just the ducks. This is not a duck. <laughs> and um, if you're lucky, you'll see a loon, they carry their young on their back in the summer. So that's really interesting to note. In Newfoundland, we are also incredibly lucky to have a whole bunch of seabirds, which are not common necessarily elsewhere in, in North America. Um, so seabirds aren't going to be a category of their own in your field guide. They are usually going to be found near the beginning of the guide though. Um, and they are made up of different families, but they are similar in the fact that they spend the, nearly their entire life um, in the open ocean. And they really only come back to land um, during breeding season. And so then they congregate in these big colonies. You can get from, I guess, dozens, but up to several thousands of birds in one spot, which is really incredible to see. Um, I'm sure some of these are awfully familiar to people like the puffin and the common mar down the bottom in Newfoundland is also known as a tur, and they've been really important um, in, for as a food source and also a sort of cultural identity in Newfoundland. Black guillemot also has a funny local name, which is a sea pigeon, uh, which is just a funny, funny note. <laughs> okay, we'll move into the diurnal raptors. Um, these are the birds of prey that are hunting during the daytime. Um, they all have these hooked bills, which they use for tearing apart their prey. And they can range drastically in size from the very large bald eagle that I'm sure most of you are familiar with down to the size of around a robin or even smaller, which is like the sharp shinned hawk or the American kestrel. And so these ones are gonna be hunting from the air or on a perch. We also have the shorebird family. And shorebirds are um, a bit trickier of a family because uh, their colors can be a bit more subdued. So if you're looking at shorebirds, it's easy to be overwhelmed. Try to be patient with yourself. You're probably not going to know um, what it is down to species every time. I struggle with shorebirds as well. Um, so if the best you can do is I say, this is a shorebird, that's perfectly fine. Don't worry about that. Um, and as you get more skilled at identifying, you'll probably be able to identify more of them. Shorebirds do often have these really long legs. They're using them to walk around on the edges of water um, or through long grasses, that sort of thing. And they do have quite a variation in the size and shape of their bill. So that's an important thing to notice when you're trying to identify the species. Um, during the summer, we don't have too many that are around, but in the fall migration, you'll probably get quite a few more species of shorebirds. Um, but again, don't be overwhelmed. Just take them as a learning opportunity and you'll get more familiar with them as time goes on. I'll note also that though they are called shorebirds, they're not always found near the shore. For example, the Wilson snipe is found often, uh, more often in the forest, but they are often associated with water. We'll move into the gulls and terns. Probably familiar to many of you are the gulls, called seagulls colloquially. Um, and in Newfoundland in the summer, we're lucky that we have uh, one, which is the great black backed gull and is quite diagnostic because um, it has this dark black back and wings, whereas the other ones have sort of a grayer or whitish back. Um, so that's gonna be a useful identification feature for you. But all of these birds are gonna be large white gray birds um, found usually near the water uh, when they're not in the parking lot. <laughs> And they are hard to identify at a distance, especially when they're flying. So again, if you can only say, this is a gull, that's perfectly fine and you're doing great. Turns are sort of the slimmer, sleeker cousins of the gulls. 
Um, and they do have longer pointier wings and tails and they have this really pointy bill. Um, they are a little bit more of an aerial acrobat because of the shape of their wings. And so that you'll, you'll notice that probably when you see them flying. We'll move on to a crowd favorite, the owls. Um, most of these are active in the nighttime. These are not all the owls that we have in Newfoundland, but just a little selection. Um, but there are some that are active in the daytime. The northern hawk owl and the short-eared owl can be active in the day. And these are all hunting um, small mammals and things like that. Um, they do all have big facial discs and that funnels sound into their ears, which are offset from each other on their head. And that helps them detect um, where their prey is with great precision. So it's really a useful feature for looking at owls. Often uh, for the owls, especially that are active in the nighttime, you may not see them, but you may only hear them. So it can be interesting to try and learn your owl song or calls as well. Woodpeckers are a very cool family and often familiar to people as well. They're the birds that you're gonna see um, sort of climbing up tree trunks, tapping or um, tapping on the wood or making holes, that sort of thing. So we do have several species here in Newfoundland. Mm, they all have stiff pointy tail feathers and they use that to prop themselves up as they climb up and down tree trunks. And they are mostly associated with a tree, but the northern flicker, which you see at the bottom here, can be found also on the ground. And that's because they really like to eat ants. And so they'll be found on the ground, um, on lawns and things like that, just picking away at ants as well. It's also interesting, the yellow-bellied sapsucker, which is um, not very common on, in Newfoundland, but they are here. And they'll, they'll drum holes into trees and then they'll actually lick the sap out of the hole. The rest of them are looking for insects. And now we have the flycatchers. The flycatchers are a little bit of a smaller bird um, and they do exactly what their name says, they catch flies. So you'll find them perching on a little branch or twig. They'll see an insect out in the air, they'll fly out and catch it and then they'll go perch back on that same branch or another one nearby and eat it. Um, and they'll just do that activity uh, for hours and hours while they're feeding. Flycatchers are also difficult to distinguish um, through how they look because they are often quite similar to each other. So this is another family where uh, being able to tell the different sounds apart can sometimes be helpful, although um, we don't have too many flycatchers in Newfoundland, so it, it's, it's a bit easier to tell them apart by sight. Here we have the corvids. Um, these include the crows, the jays, and the ravens. And these birds are incredibly intelligent. Um, I'm sure people have seen the Canada jay, which used to be called the gray jay. Uh, out at camps and uh, at the cabin, they're always trying to steal some food from you. Blue jays, you maybe have seen trying to get into your bird feeders. Um, so they are really incredibly intelligent birds. Um, same with the American crow and the common raven. So the American crow and common raven will go a little bit more into detail on them because they do look quite similar. We have both of them here. If the American crow is flying, you'll be able to see that its tail is quite rounded on the end. As opposed to if you see a raven flying, its tail is gonna be diamond or wedge shaped. So that's a really good point for when they're flying. If they're perched, you're gonna to wanna to look at the bill so the American crow has a shorter bill. Um, it's shorter than the, than the length of its head, whereas the raven has a bill that's about the length of its head or longer. And you also wanna look at the throat. A crow is gonna have these smooth, sleek throat feathers, whereas a raven has these longer, shaggy feathers on its throat. So those are just some good points for a crow and a raven. We'll move along now to the swallows. Swallows are um, very acrobatic birds when they're flying. They have these long pointy wings that really help them. Uh, they can turn quickly, dive. They're always catching flies and insects in the air. So they are also aerial insectivores. And you will be able to see that they are swallows. They almost look like bats while they're flying. 
um, just because of how quickly they change in direction. They're so comfortable in the air. Um, and they do range from, for example, the tree swallow. You might see them around town, um, around open areas. They can nest in boxes that are put up by humans. Barn swallows are pretty comfortable nesting in human structures as well. But then you go along to the bank swallow and it's more likely to be found um, off by itself, not inside of a town. Here we have the chickadees and nuthatches. So these are the birds, they're gonna, they're pretty small again. Um, they're gonna be coming to feeders if you have one up. You can see them in towns or along edges of towns as well. Um, they're also kind of inquisitive often. And the nuthatches are really interesting because when you see them um, walking on a tree trunk, they're gonna be walking upside down. So the head is gonna be facing down to the ground. And that's quite different from any other, any other family that you're gonna see. The black cap chickadee and the boreal chickadee, uh, you can tell quite quickly that they look different because the black cap chickadee has a black on the top of its head and boreal chickadee is brown. Here are the thrushes. Um, this is a, one of my personal favorite families. <laughs> um, most people know the American robin, which is a type of thrush. And the other thrushes that we, found, that we find in Newfoundland look pretty similar to each other. And they're often more secretive. They're not gonna be around in the middle of town. Um, they're sort of like backwoods kinds of birds. Um, so, but all of these birds do have these long, long legs. They hop around on the ground. They're looking for things in the leaf litter. Um, and they all have these sturdy, sturdy longer beaks as well as kind of a broader chest area. So those are the thrushes. And now we're gonna get to the warblers. The warblers um, are considered sometimes the jewel of, of the songbirds. And they're all tiny little birds, really bright and colorful. They're always super active, hopping around. It's so hard to see them sitting in one spot at a time. And it's really easy to become overwhelmed by trying to figure out what a warbler is when you're starting. I will urge you to not worry so much about them. <laughs> um, enjoy them. Look at them as much as you can, try and get as many clues as you can. But if all you can tell is that's a warbler, that's perfectly fine. You're doing great. We do have three that you can try and focus on that are maybe more common uh, closer to town. Um, and I know the yellow rumped warbler is already back um, from migration already. So you can take a look at these three, the yellow warbler, the black and white warbler, and the yellow rumped warbler. And you can try and move on from there. So start small and work your way up from there, with the warblers especially. I'll note again for the warblers, the males and the females also look different from each other. So do note that. We'll move into the sparrows and juncos. These ones are sometimes difficult uh, to tell apart, especially because sparrows are often sort of small brown birds, but you're gonna wanna look at the patterns on the breast and belly, like I mentioned earlier. Um, these birds all are gonna have this strong conical shaped bill that they're using for cracking seeds open. Um, yeah, so pay attention to those couple of clues and take your time with the sparrows as well. Here we have the blackbirds. All the blackbirds are gonna have a sort of long conical bill. Um, they're often associated near water. You can see them sometimes around in town as well, some of them. Um, but blackbirds are quite a larger bird, a bit bigger than a robin. Um, and they're all these bold, dark colors. And here we're gonna move on to the finches and grosbeaks. These are another family that are happy to come to bird feeders, especially in the winter. Um, males and females, again, look different from each other. But they're often found in cities and towns, so you might have a bit of a chance to look at them more often. And they are also seed eating, so they have these uh, strong conical shaped bills, um, sort of triangular bills. So that's a key feature for them. And they're also going to be found often nearer to the tops of trees rather than hopping around on the ground. And I've left this little bird to the last one. This is the house sparrow, and they're really common in towns. Um, you'll see the male on the left and the female on the right. They're going to be all over your neighborhood. Uh, they nest like in any little crack they can find in houses and things like that. And they're sort of incessantly cheeping. So you probably have all seen or heard one of these before. Um, 
And I've left them to the end because they're actually European species. Um, and they're not really related to many of our sparrows at all. And so that you're often going to find them at the end of your field guide. Perfect. So that's going to wrap up all of the families that we're going to go through today. Um, and again, doesn't include every species or anything, but just sort of some broad strokes to get you guys started. If you do want to practice a little bit um, as you're getting to know things or even um, when you become more familiar, there's a few online resources you can use. This one is a eBird quiz. It's free online. Again, for all of these, I'll, I'll send a, a follow-up email with information about them. So don't worry about jotting things down. Basically, you're going to be able to put in information about where you are, when you're interested in, and it's going to give you a picture or a song as sort of a quiz. Um, and it's going to give you these options of birds on the side that you can choose between. If you're just beginning, I urge you to not take this as a test or an exam, just use it as a learning tool like we did with the Merlin app. And so if you say, I know this is a pine grosbeak, for example, just take a look at those other species, see how they're different, um, and just learn the differences between them. So it could be a really good tool for that. I'll say that Nature NL uh, organization here, you can find that on Facebook, um, they run bird learning nights where they go through these eBird quizzes as a group. And so that can be really, really helpful to hear how other, other people are coming to their identification. Another online tool you can use is Dendroika. Um, it's a really great resource because it just has this huge database of photos, songs, and calls of all the species. Um, if you make a free online login, you can customize the groups and lists. Um, so if you want to look only at ducks one day, you can just make a list of ducks in your area, that sort of thing. So Dendroica is a really good place to, to go into and learn some more. And one last one that I'll mention is that Birds Canada has a photo identification guide. Um, same sort of thing, you can put in your location and the date, and it will give you a sheet with all the species that you could expect there with pictures. Um, so this is really cool if you want to have like a, a house list or a yard list and try and check off which ones you could see. Or if you want to have an activity with your family or children, uh, you can always print these off and go see what you can find in your nearby park, that kind of thing. Um, so this is a great learning tool and also could be a fun activity. So really one, really good one to note. And that's going to bring us to the end there. So thank you everybody for sticking around. I hope that you feel a little bit more confident in being able to start identifying birds. If you do have any questions, feel free to email me um, or Catherine at uh, the email you can find here. You could check out um, the website of the Atlas. If you're interested in knowing more about the Breeding Bird Atlas or about the Nocturnal Owl Survey, you can also reach out at the same email. We can try and give you some information on that. Um, let me just see here. We also have a few workshops about the Atlas coming up in the next couple of weeks, and you can find information on that, how to become involved or what actually the Atlas is about. Um, and you can find those events on our Facebook page as well, or our email, or sorry, or our website. <laughs> okay, so thank you, everybody. Remember, while you're learning, everybody started out as a beginner. Don't get overwhelmed. Uh, be patient with yourself. And I hope you've enjoyed your time today. I think it's three o'clock on the dot. So I see just a couple of things in the chat. Um, you can feel free to head out. I'll just take a look at these and see if there's any questions to answer. But thank you all.